Here we have two different point standings from the same year, one accounting for all points earned all season long, and the other being the actual result. And while the real NASCAR points format may be a bit screwy, it still consistently produces a top 10, top 5, top 3, and on occasion, a top 1 champion. You can say what you will about the playoffs, but they have never produced an outright undeserved winner. Every person on that stage truly deserves to be there. The champ is always... wait a minute. 20th. He got the 20th most points and still won the title. What the fuck? Back when Drake was doing this, and we were all going to war over the color of a dress, NASCAR was entering its third season of the Generation 6, and so far it was performing quite well. It was an absolute piss missile on the super speedways, tons of fun on the road courses and short tracks, and even produced some solid shows on the cookie cutters. NASCAR, however, was not satisfied. Ratings were dropping, and they wanted to stem the tide in any way they could, so they did the unthinkable. NASCAR would slow things down, lowering their horsepower from 850 to 725. Senior Vice President and Chief International Officer at the time, Gene Stefanician, said, quote, It's not going to be as dramatic as most people think. We're hoping it will make racing better, closer. Our goals are always that, right? To provide better entertainment for our fans. And surely it would. Surely this wouldn't begin a downward spiral of meddling and manipulation that would render the racing completely stoic for almost five years. But for now, they were going to try it out. And thus began the 2015 NASCAR season. But before we get to that, I'd like to take a minute and thank our sponsors... <laughs> Nah, just kidding. Nobody sponsors me. But there was a pretty shocking storyline heading into this year. One that would bring an end to one of the greatest runs in racing. Yeah, I know some of you are probably disappointed, but um, you know, I've been thinking about this day for a long time. Uh, and, and to me, I just think of how proud I am to have the fans that I have, to have the team that I have, and to have had this amazing career. Having been arguably the best driver in the previous year, it came as a shock that Gordon, age 44 and still as stout as ever, was ready to hang it up but in retrospect, it was perfect timing. He had started his career alongside names like Waltrip, Earnhardt, and Elliott, and now, 23 years later, he would wrap things up just the same. As he led the field to Green and Daytona, all seemed right, as fan favorites like Jimmy Johnson, Dale Jr., and Carl Edwards completed the first two rows. But looming just behind them, and way behind them, was the most unlikable duo in all of NASCAR, Penske Racing's Joey Logano and Brad Keselowski. Fans' opinions of these two have softened over time, but make no mistake, eight years ago there were no two more hated drivers than Sliced Bread and Bad Brad, who him by himself single-handedly turned the entire garage against him in 2014. Between swerving at Kurt Busch, brake-checking Matt Kenseth, attempting to turn Denny Hamlin, slamming into Tony Stewart on pit road, and starting a melee with Kevin Harvick and Jeff Gordon, he had well established his place as public enemy number one. As for Logano, his descent to disgrace will have to wait, because while Jeff Gordon slides sideways on the backstretch, the 22 would cruise across the line to win the great American race. This would kick off a bit of a troublesome trend that, in my opinion, reflected a turning point. Gone were the days of domination by teams like Roush and Richard Childress, and seasoned veterans like Greg Biffle, Tony Stewart, and Casey Kane were struggling to hold their own. Hell, even Wonder Boy, in the midst of his last gasp, was just barely treading water, and even the guys that were still winning, like Jimmy Johnson, Dale Jr., Carl Edwards, and Matt Kenseth, were struggling to keep up with the hot shots, the young guns, some of who weren't all that young anymore. Guys like Logano, Keselowski, Kurt Busch, and defending series champ Kevin Harvick had officially found their way to the top, blitzing the competition week in and week out. Though as the season carried on, another name would be added to that list, a name that hadn't been this close to the top since a decade ago, back in his days in the Busch series. Martin Truex had been garbage in the year before, relegating Furniture Row Racing back to being a backmarker. But after moving lead race engineer Cole Pern up to the pit box, 2015 opened up a whole new chapter. In the first 15 races, they only finished outside the top 10 once, and boasted second in points for most of that time. Finding victory, however, was a different story. As for a handful of weeks, it just seemed like the racing gods had it out for poor Martin. From Kansas to Charlotte to Dover, he led a combined 357 laps, dominating each respective affair. But whether it was pit strategy, other people's pit strategy, or some Formula One-style team orders, the 78 just couldn't seem to put it all together. The following week was the same story, Truex out front, dominating and leading the most laps. But as those laps wound down, things were strangely calm. No late cautions, no problematic pit stops, no 42-car pileups, just open road which Truex would drive all the way to his biggest win yet. Martin Truex Jr. wins Pocono for his third Sprint Cup triumph. In today's world of monopolization, this was one for the books. A small single-car team from Denver, Colorado, going the distance and sticking it to their southeastern competitors. 
It was an upset for the ages, which was good, because the following week would be back to business as usual. Michigan, being a two-mile behemoth, put the horsepower reduction on full display. And while they were right that fans couldn't really tell the difference, NASCAR thought they had discovered a cure-all. Yes, the cars raced closer together, but their reliance on draft made them harder to pass. But for now, at least, they could still put on a halfway decent show. The only way it could be ruined is if NASCAR took this concept further by reducing the horsepower further and turned their races into fans watching a 40-car train for four hours, but surely they'd never do that. Back to the race at hand, a young Kyle Larson came close to capturing the second major upset in a row, but Kurt Busch would outlast him to take a rain-shortened win. The following week, the beat would roll on as he would finish runner-up to the other Busch, his brother, the last piece to this puzzle who's had it pretty rough up to this point. If the Penske guys had slightly dented their image, then Kyle Busch has been mercilessly massacring it for years now. Up to this point, he's carefully crafted a decade's worth of takeouts and tantrums that have him sealed as a heel, the one guy everyone loves to hate. No, seriously, if you weren't a fan of his, you absolutely despised him, and there was no in-between. But unfortunately for the fans, he was as fast as he was frustrating, putting himself in the championship hunt numerous times. After an abysmal 2014, however, he plans to turn things around with new crew chief Adam Stevens. That is, until he got turned around in the Xfinity race at Daytona and slammed the inside wall, breaking his right leg and left foot in the process. This would take him out from February to May, a hiatus that, in any other motorsport, would destroy any and all championship aspirations. But with a return to Charlotte and a waiver from NASCAR, Kyle was cleared to compete for the postseason. If he could win a race and finish top 30 in points, he could race for a championship. It was an incredibly courteous gesture by NASCAR, who didn't want to bar one of their top stars, but it did raise some red flags. As while fans were sympathetic to Bush's plight, they also raised some legitimate concerns about the meaning of playoff eligibility. NASCAR had made it clear up to this point that if you want to be in the playoffs, you have to run every race, no ifs, ands, or buts. But beyond that, this was simply unheard of. Plenty of other drivers' chances at a chip across all forms of motorsport across all time have been derailed by injuries. Never before could you miss so many races and still not only be eligible to win, but have some of the best odds too. Because after a staggering four wins in five races, Bush would enter the playoffs tied, seated in P1. The impossible was not just feasible, but likely. Though that advantage would disintegrate fast, with a blown tire in New Hampshire that would leave him entering the first elimination race below the cut line. Thankfully, after an uncharacteristically bad showing from Jimmy Johnson, Bush was spared and would coast on through the playoffs alongside his teammate, Matt Kenseth, who in the second race of the next round looked like he was ready to punch his ticket with a win in Kansas. Joey Logano, however, still in the good graces of most NASCAR fans, had other plans. And around goes the 20, sideways in front of the 22! Kansas slides, touch it comes out! Remember when I talked about Logano becoming disgraced? This was the turning point, where everyone watching suddenly turned on the 22. Now you might ask yourself, is it really that bad? So he entered the corner a little hot, what's the big deal? Two things. Number one, the hype surrounding him had been suffocating. Since he was a kid, he was one of the most highly touted prospects in all of auto racing. The guy's nickname is literally sliced bread, because supposedly he's the best thing since. And while he certainly proved that this season, he doesn't have the notoriety or respect of his competitors to fall on. So when he slips up, he best wear it on his sleeve. What does he do? <laughs> This is good hard racing, you know, uh, we race each other really hard and that's hard racing, that's the way I race. If I race, uh, if I get raced like that, I'll race the same way. That's just uh, how I've always been and it'll, it'll always be that way. Now that's fair enough. I mean, Kenseth did rough him up a little, but most people seem to think that the punishment didn't fit the crime. And that leads me to number two. Logano had just won in the week prior. He was already locked into the next round. Hell, he was the only one locked in. Matt Kenseth, on the other hand, after slamming the wall in Charlotte, needed a good run today. He needed this win. Joey took it from him, claiming two-thirds of the second round all to himself. Heading into Talladega, it would be hard to imagine a less popular winner than the 22 crew. Just like in the spring, it looked like no one could contest the Hendrick cars, but as the intensity ramped up, more people tried to. And towards the end, the front of the pack would see who else but Brad Keselowski and his now equally despised teammate. After a caution with five to go, they would attempt to restart the race, but couldn't even make it to the line before crashing. This set up one more attempt. One more shot for Dale Jr., who's been far and away the quickest all day, to be the hero of the race. Behind him, however, Kevin Harvick has a transmission problem and can't get it out of gear. He has to fight so he can advance, but can't get his car to go faster than 80. But he can't just slip back and let everyone pass or else he'll be eliminated. He has to do something, and what would transpire has to be one of the worst finishes to a NASCAR race. 
The four not going. They wreck behind him. The green flag is out as they cross the start finish line. Trying to get back up to speed. Caution comes out. Now the question is, who was in front? They are telling us that the 22 was in front. And so Joey Logano will sweep round two. Once again, you might think to yourself, is this really that bad? So the race ended with a wreck. That's happened before. But I want you to take a moment and put yourself in that crowd. You just watched Redneck Jesus, the single most revered driver in the entire field, be edged out by, to quote Ryan Newman, and for the third week in a row, the most disliked driver found himself in victory lane. He just couldn't be stopped. From Jimmy Johnson to Matt Kenseth to Dale Jr., all of NASCAR's faces had failed to dethrone the kid, though thankfully there was still one left standing, one who has experience with unpopular Talladega wins. As was the formula at this point, Logano would set sail and lead the rest of the field in the dust, with few others even able to keep pace with him. Not since 2007 has anyone won four races in a row, but on this day in Martinsville, Logano's got a pretty good shot. That is, until Danica Danica had brought out the caution, setting the field up for another disheartening restart that would see Logano's teammate take out his adversary in Kenza, as he drove off into the sunset. Meanwhile, Jeff Gordon, still searching for his swan song win, would quietly slip into second, but was helpless to mount a charge against the indomitable 22, which would once again scoot away. All seemed completely lost, as to this point, the entire season had reflected a changing tide. How the old guard was finished, ready to make way for the new. But the new was unapologetic, unethical, undisciplined. They simply did not play by the same rules, not because they didn't learn them, but because they had no one to teach them. Well, today, Matt Kenseth has seen enough, and despite being battered beyond repair and seconds off the pace, he would teach a valuable lesson by taking Joey Logano to school. Kenseth cleared by Logano, maybe no! Kenseth takes him out! Logano into the wall! Caution comes out and the crowd roars! You can tell how the fans feel about it. Now you might be thinking, damn, wasn't that a bit harsh? Everything up till now was just racing. But when you consider the extraneous circumstances surrounding this moment, you'll know that it was never just racing. It was to send a message. You might be hot stuff, a star in the making, maybe even a star in the present. But without the notoriety or respect of those who came before you, you're not going far. You can even hear it in the driver radios, as while the young guys seemed almost offended by the ordeal. You kidding me? That's ridiculous. I just can't get over what this series has come to, just how f***ed up it is. The older guys seem to approve. That looks like it hurt. Hell, I've heard of wrecking a guy, but not getting everybody f***ing the inning. That's awesome. I mean, he didn't take him out, he jumped him. For, for me, I would say that it cost Joey Logano a championship. I think that they had the best car that year. I think Kansas doesn't happen, Martinsville doesn't happen, and he wins the championship. While hindsight is 2020, I do agree that if not for this moment, Joey Logano would have been the 2015 champion. For those handful of weeks, he was unbeatable, and while Matt may have carried out the act, the only one who could stop Joey was, ironically, Joey himself. And now the race was wide open for the most revered, respected driver in the field to finally return to victory lane. This win's gonna punch his ticket to the championship four! Gordon wins in Martinsville! To say this was a sight for sore eyes would be a gross understatement, though there was still a greater prize to be won. The following week would see a late surge by Jimmy Johnson to beat Brad Keselowski and rebound from his disappointing playoff exit. And after that, the fan favorite Dale Jr. would find his own slice of redemption by winning a rain-shortened race in Phoenix. And the championship four would emerge as the defending champ in Kevin Harvick, the ultimate underdog in Martin Truex, the comeback kid in Kyle Busch, and of course, the greatest of his era, Jeff Gordon. It would be the single highest stakes championship race of any playoffs, though after the way this season started, I don't think that anyone could have predicted the outcome. Kyle Busch, the 2015 NASCAR Sprint Cup champion. For some, it was one of the greatest comeback stories in sports, from breaking a leg in week one to running away in week 36. If it wasn't enough that he had made a full recovery in just over two months, it only took him one more to return to the top of the heap and dominate the bulk of the summer. And right at the very end, right when most had him scratched, he would take his first win at Homestead, Miami, proving why you can never count Kyle Busch out. Still, some put a big ol' asterisk next to that title, and for good reason. Every champion that came before had to run, at the very least, the heavy majority of the schedule, and Kyle missed almost a third. Without the playoff format and the waiver from NASCAR, he wouldn't have even come close, but as they say, you play with the hand you're dealt, and Kyle had some pretty good cards. As for the now former champion, it was still a year to be proud of, but the lack of trophy left a sour taste considering without eliminations, he could have been the champion. Logano, on the other hand, could take some solace in that fact, 
though the margin in the end would be a mere 22 points, while the swing from Martinsville would be about 40. Even in the realm of fantasy, this was the decider, and it would take another three years for Logano to finally redeem himself. He's just one of two multi-time champions in the cup field today, though one has to wonder if that missing ring still haunts him. As for Truex, this would be the beginning of one of the greatest career resurgences in racing, as just two years later he would lead his ragtag group of Denverites to one of the most dominant championship runs in recent memory. And as for the old heads, they too would continue to establish their place amongst the greats, as after Gordon's landmark win, each of them would achieve their own last hurrahs soon after, achieving their own final victories, and while some had the feeling of finality, others were completely unassuming. In some cases, no one had any clue that it would be their last trip to victory lane, but that's why you celebrate every win like it's your last, because one of them very well could be. And what of those young guns, the ones that had previously been peppered by booze and beer cans? Well, whether or not the fans were ready, they were the future, and that future in large part would be led by our champion, as Kyle Busch has since spent the rest of his career filling the role of those he once disrespected. In fact, you could say the same of Joey Logano and Brad Keselowski and Denny Hamlin among others. Once upon a time, these were the most hated names in NASCAR, and while to some they still are, they've at least built up the resumes to call themselves veterans, a status they now use to educate others in the same ways that they were taught all those years ago. Now you might be thinking, is this really NASCAR's worst season? There was so much that happened, so much to appreciate, and in this one case, I will concede your point. The championship was skewed, the racing was mid, the sport was unchanging, the least popular drivers were winning every week, and our favorite drivers were beginning to show their age. But it still gave us plenty of memorable moments and a lasting impact we're still feeling to this day. Because even at its worst, NASCAR is still pretty damned good. Thanks for watching.